confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. A hundred years ago, a devastating plague struck the people of Alabama, USA. A small insect named the boll weevil had invaded the farms and was destroying the cotton plants the farmers grew. The boll weevil is a very tiny insect, but it was almost impossible to get rid of. And since 99% of all of the farms in that area grew cotton, the boll weevil was destroying the land and the people's livelihoods. Almost overnight, a tiny little insect was causing poverty and suffering and hardship. There seemed to be no way out. But then a scientist named George Washington Carver discovered that peanuts, a type of ground nut, would thrive in the soil in that area. The boll weevil could not eat the peanut plants. And best of all, peanuts were worth a lot more money than cotton. So a farmer named C.W. Baston took a step of faith and began planting peanuts instead of cotton. His first harvest brought in far more money than he'd made with cotton. He was able to pay off all his debts and even keep a sizable profit. And the resurrection of Farmer Baston's fortunes brought a revelation to the entire community. When other farmers saw how Farmer Baston succeeded in growing peanuts instead of cotton, they began to follow his example. And as the impact of the revelation spread, prosperity returned to Alabama, USA. That's why if you visit the town of Enterprise, Alabama today, you'll discover a statue in the middle of their town dedicated to the boll weevil. Now, why would the people of Alabama erect a statue to the insect that brought them so much suffering? The fact is, the insect that brought devastation became the catalyst for renewed prosperity. It's the first statue in the world erected in honor of an insect but it's a testimony to the fact that the death of one crop led to the birth of something better. There's a powerful lesson for all of us in the amazing true story of the boll weevil. When something destructive comes our way, God always has a way out. He has a plan to bring resurrection to our lives. But in order for the power of the resurrection to impact us, it requires revelation. In order to get the benefits of what God brings to us with resurrection power, we have to see things from a new perspective. That's what happened to the disciples after Jesus rose from the dead. First came the resurrection when the power of God brought Jesus up from the dead. But after the resurrection, the disciples needed revelation in order to apply the resurrection power to their lives. Even after Jesus rose from the dead, some of his disciples still doubted. Some still hid in fear. Some, like Thomas, would not believe until they had a personal revelation of Jesus for themselves. And the same is true for all of us. We've heard about Jesus' resurrection. We've celebrated his victory over death. But in order to apply that victory to our lives, we need revelation. We need a new mindset that will help us live today in resurrection power. And that's the purpose of our sermon today, to take the resurrection we celebrated last week and apply it to our lives right now. We're going to discover the truth that will help us move beyond just knowing about the power of the resurrection to actually experiencing the power of the resurrection in our lives today. But before we learn more, won't you join me as we bow our heads and pray? Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you so much that your power is present here with us. The power of Jesus over death, the power of Jesus over every other force is available to us. But help us today, Lord, to learn. Give us the revelation we need to move beyond head knowledge into heart knowledge. Help us to discover the truths today that will help us put resurrection power to application in our life. We submit to you right now, we bind every voice of the enemy that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to give us revelation that we might live the life you've called us to live. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. I want to invite you to join your faith with mine right now. If you would, wherever you are, just put your hand on your chest and say after me, Lord Jesus, Speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Agape House Online. It's great to have you join us today as we come to the conclusion of our sermon series titled The Power of the Resurrection. For the last few weeks, we've been studying the great and glorious truths about Jesus' resurrection. We've seen how Jesus comes to interrupt our funerals. We've seen how he overcame death and opened a way for all of us to experience life. But today, God wants to give us more than head knowledge about the power of the resurrection. He wants us to do more than celebrate what Christ has done for us. God wants us to experience the power of the resurrection in our own lives every day. He wants to give us revelation so that we can receive the full blessings of his triumph over death. We need to go beyond remembrance and embrace the reality of resurrection power in our own lives. Now, to help us do that today, Today, we're going to look at the life of a man who did experience the resurrection of Jesus in his own life. He's a man just like you and I, and he received resurrection power from Christ. His name is Lazarus, and in his story, we're going to learn today how resurrection power can work for each and every one of us. To help us learn that truth, we've prepared sermon notes to guide us today. Now, the notes are available for you free to download at our website at agapehousegana.org and, of course, on our Facebook page at Agape House New Testament Church. So I invite you to go ahead, download the notes right now, and follow along with me as we discover how to experience resurrection power in your life today. Our scripture text for today is found in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Hear the word of the Lord. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your hearts today in Jesus' name and everybody shout amen. Our story begins with just a few basic facts. Jesus had a friend named Lazarus, and Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. They lived in Bethany, and a day came when Lazarus got sick, and so the sisters sent for Jesus. They knew the sickness was serious, and they wanted Christ to come and heal their brother. But there's something deeper in these verses than just the basic facts. In verse 4, Jesus gives us an understanding of the purpose of God in this situation. He declares by faith the final outcome. It will not end in death, Jesus said, but in the glory of God. And by making this declaration, Jesus says, I'm going to work in this story to bring about the purpose and the glory of God. But surprisingly, the path to God's purpose and glory takes an unexpected turn. There's a process that God takes this family through. And when we understand that process that led to Lazarus' resurrection, then we will be able to apply the truth to our lives so that we can also experience God's purpose and God's glory in our lives as well. So today, let's unwrap this story as we discover how to experience resurrection power in your life today. And here's the first step to experiencing resurrection power. You have to face it. Life has unmet expectations. Now, that might seem like a strange place to begin, but the first stage in resurrection is that you need to face the facts. Life is full of unmet expectations. See, the truth is before there can be a resurrection, there has to be a death. Before you get a testimony, you pass through a test. And that's exactly what happened in Lazarus' story. When Lazarus got sick, his sisters Mary and Martha sent for Jesus. They were friends of Jesus. Listen to their words. Your dear friend is very sick. They believed Jesus could heal their brother. So because they were friends and because they believed in Jesus, they knew Jesus could come and heal. They expected him to deliver them. But Jesus does something unusual. When he receives the request, he remains another few days where he was. Verses 5 and 6 tell us, So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Even though he loves them, even though he has the power to deliver them, he delays. And then after waiting, he sets off to visit his friends. But by the time he gets to Bethany, he's told that Lazarus has died. In fact, verse 17 says, Lazarus had already been in the grave for four good 
days. And think about for a minute what that meant to Mary and Martha, how they must have felt. They called on Jesus to help. They knew he could. They expected him to heal. But rather than Jesus coming when they wanted him and when they needed him, he didn't show up till it was too late. His lack of response led to their brother's death. So when they see Jesus, both of them say the same thing in John eleven twenty one 21 and verse 32. They both said this, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. The fact is the sisters had unmet expectations. They had expectations and Jesus did not meet them. Mary and Martha asked for Jesus to come, but he delayed and their brother died. And when you think about it, unmet expectations are a problem not just for Mary and Martha, but for all of us too. In fact, a lot of people often feel disappointed with God. But the problem is not that God fails. It's not that God isn't good. It's not that he's not powerful or faithful. The problem is that we human beings expect Jesus to do what we want. We want Jesus to conform to our will and our ways, but Jesus never follows the will of the people. He only follows his father's will. He doesn't do what we want. He does what his father wants. And what God wants is to put to death anything in our lives that will limit his glory being revealed in us. God wants to raise us up in his image and in his resurrection power. But in order for there to be a resurrection, there has to first be a death. Lazarus had to die before he could have the miracle of resurrection. Jesus had to die before he could rise from the grave. And even though it's painful, the only path to resurrection power in your life is the path of death. See, God sent me here today to tell you that something has to die in your life in order for the purpose and the glory of God to be seen in you. You have to die to your expectations so that you can be resurrected for the glory of God. You have to die to your own desires and to your own dreams so that God's desires and God's dreams can come up in your life. You have to die to the natural so that the supernatural can be resurrected in you. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. Everything that aims for the glory of man has to die. But everything that aims for the glory of God will always experience resurrection power. It's so important that all of us understand this truth today. See, right now, God is shifting and shaking the earth. The Bible says in Hebrew, God said, once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. And right now, all around the globe, God is shaking everything that can be shaking. He's pruning and purifying his people. For Jesus said in John 15, one and two. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. And hear the word of the Lord to you today. God says, I'm shaking the earth and I'm pruning my people. I'm cutting off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. So God the father is removing the things from his own house that don't produce fruit. He's cleaning up and clearing out things in his own people that aren't for his glory for even fruitful branches are being pruned and cut back so they will become more fruitful God is putting to death the flesh that he might resurrect the things that aim only for his glory he's putting to death the selfishness and the pride and the greed and the hypocrisy and the reliance upon man he's putting to death anything and everything that relies on the flesh to survive And during this pandemic, some things that are not from God are going to die. Some relationships will not survive this lockdown. Some ministries will not survive this lockdown. Even some dreams will not survive this lockdown. But here's the good news to hold on to today. God will always resurrect whatever brings glory to his name. He'll always cause to live any man or any ministry or any dream or any relationship that will bring glory to his name. And in this day and hour, God is sifting the wheat from the tares. He's separating the true from the false. He's putting the fleshly to death and raising the spiritual 
to new life. And if you have faith today, you'll not fear the death of the flesh. In fact, if you love the Lord, you will rejoice in the death of the flesh. For you see, when you have faith and when you're devoted to God, your confidence is in the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And when your confidence is in Jesus, you will trust him to bring back to life everything that belongs to him and brings him glory. If you have faith today, you'll lift your hands to God and say, Lord, put to death everything in my life that doesn't bring glory to you. Put to death every dream, every relationship, every idea, every plan, every project that doesn't glorify you. Put to death everything that is of the flesh. For I declare to you today, it's time for all the works of the flesh in your life to be put to death and buried. It's time for a resurrection of lives that bring glory to God, of dreams that bring glory to God, of ministries that bring glory to God, of churches that bring glory to God, of businesses that bring glory to God. For in Isaiah 42, 8, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else. So hear me well today. God will not share his glory with you. God will not share his glory with me. God will not share his glory with any man. He's bringing to death everything that seeks to lift up the name of a man or a ministry and he will bring out to the forefront and shine his spotlight on those things dedicated to bringing glory to him. That's what we see in the story of Lazarus. Before his death, before resurrection power came to him, he was a man of a little bit of influence. After all, he hosted a dinner party for Jesus. He was known in his community. But when he died and resurrection power entered his life, his influence increased exponentially. Today, Lazarus is known around the world, and here we are 2,000 years later speaking about him because something died so resurrection power could come in. And the truth is Lazarus would never have had that level of influence and impact had he not died and been resurrected. And so it is in your life. God says to you today, if you'll allow me to put your ability to death so that God's supernatural ability can be displayed in you, you will exponentially increase in what your life will accomplish. If you'll allow God to put your natural talents and your dreams to death so that he can display his resurrection power, his supernatural abilities in you, you will see an acceleration in your influence. God is calling you today to surrender to him so that whatever is born of the flesh in your life will die so that only what brings glory to God will live. For when the flesh dies, you'll see his supernatural power displayed in you. He will take you further than you can go on your own. See, what you think is an unmet need in your life is actually God working in you to display his glory and his power in you. God is using this time of lockdown and restriction to work his resurrection power in his people. He's using this time of closed doors and limited opportunities to bring death to things that don't glorify him so that he can resurrect those things that will bring him great glory. For I declare to you today, God is tired of people trying to use the ministry to bring glory to themselves. God is tired of so-called prophets who preach messages that glorify themselves. God is tired of preachers who are more interested in being rich and famous and getting ahead of other pastors than they are in winning souls. God is tired of singers and musicians who are more focused on receiving applause than on giving praise to God. And God is looking today for people who are wholly devoted to him, who seek only his glory. And God will raise up such a people in this generation for this is the day and this is the hour when he's separating the wheat from the tares. He's making a distinction between people who are in the church for selfish gain and those who are here for the glory of God. This is the day and the hour when the true followers of Christ are going to see his resurrection power on display in their lives. But in order to bring glory to God, you have to die to your own expectations and live for his. You have to align your expectation with his will. That's why Psalm 62 5 says, my soul Wait silently for God alone, for my expectation 
is from him. And the only way to overcome the challenge of unmet expectations is to surrender your will to God. Let your expectation be centered on Christ and Christ alone. So here's the truth you need to put on your keychain and carry along with you. Don't surrender to disappointment. Surrender your disappointment to God. Lay down your own will and your own understanding. Put your hope in him. For as it says in Isaiah 49, 23, then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Maybe you're here today and you feel as if your dream has died. Do you feel as if your expectations are cut off? God's allowing a death to incur inside of you so that he can bring a resurrection in your life. You may not know why, you may not know when, but know this, when you surrender to him, he will raise you up for his glory. Because after the death, there's resurrection. After the waiting, there's hope. After the disappointment, there's a new start. That's why God tells us in Isaiah 40, 31, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And I'm declaring to you today that God is working it out. He's doing something you don't see. He's preparing a resurrection that will not only deliver you, but will bring glory to God, so don't lose heart, even though you don't see the answer. That's the story we can learn from the fern and the bamboo. The fern, as we all know, is a beautiful plant that grows very quickly in the forests all around the world. It spreads its leaves along the forest path and brightens every land. When the fern seed is planted in the ground, it can start to sprout in just a matter of days and it grows so quickly within a week, you can have a beautiful fern plant. But the bamboo is quite different. When a bamboo seed is sown into the ground, it takes five years before it starts to sprout. For five years, you don't see any movement. For five years, you don't see any life. It's out of sight. It seems to be dead, buried, forgotten, useless. But in the fifth year, a tiny bamboo sprout emerges from the earth. Compared to the fern, it's seemingly small and insignificant. But just six months later, the bamboo rises to over 30 meters in height. It had spent five years growing roots, and those roots made it strong and gave it what it needed to survive. And that's how it is in our lives. When we allow God to have his way, he will bring about his plan and purpose for our lives in his time. All those years that seem dormant, all those years of darkness where your life simply seems buried underground are a time when God is growing your roots. In his time, it will spring up and rise to become a mighty plant for his glory. So do not despair, my friend. This is not the end. You are not forgotten. God has something better in mind. He's working in the dark time. He's working underground. He's working even when it seems like he hasn't met your need. He's still working to bring resurrection power into your life. And when you understand that truth, it brings you to the second stage in resurrection. In order to experience the resurrection power in your life today, you have to have faith that there is un finished business. Listen to what Jesus said in John 11, 4. Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God. See, Jesus knows what we don't know. He knows the end has not yet come. When he heard that Lazarus had died, he wasn't worried because he already knew that Lazarus' story wouldn't end in death. The fact is, we can handle unmet expectations when we realize that this is not the end. And friends, as long as Jesus is in our lives, it is never the end. No matter how sad we are or how bad things appear, with Jesus, there's always hope. For even when we die, it's not the end. That's why in John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus told Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And the fact is it never ends in death for God's children. It 
always ends in life. Jesus boldly declared, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. There was death before the end, but the end was not death. He had to go through death, but then came the resurrection. And I say to you today, your situation will not end in death. You may have to pass through something to get to the goal. You may have to go through the valley of death to get to the resurrection, but the resurrection awaits everyone whose hope is in God. That's why Psalm 30 verse 5 says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. So just lift up your hands with me today and say after me, this is not the end. See, God didn't bring death to the flesh just so he could bury you and keep you in the grave. He brought death to the flesh so that something better could be resurrected. He has unfinished business in your life. So do not weep and do not wail. Do not mourn like those without hope for the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is coming upon you today and he will bring forth in your life everything that will glorify him. If you don't give up, if you don't back down, if you don't turn back, if you don't grow weak in your faith, you will see the glory of God in your life. For everything God plans always comes to pass. That's why Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, remember the things I've done in the past. For I alone am God. I'm God and there's none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything, somebody say everything. Everything I plan will come to pass for I do whatever I wish. And that's why you can be at peace no matter what your circumstances look like. For if what has died in your life belongs to God, it will be resurrected. When you have the power of God in you, you will rise again. Any dream, any hope, any business, any ministry, any gift, any relationship, any opportunity that God has brought into your life for his glory will come out of the grave and will live again. That's why the Apostle Paul could confidently proclaim in Philippians 1, 6, I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. No matter how bad it looks, this is not the end. That's the lesson we can learn from the inspiring true story of a man named James Costello. James Costello and his friends had gathered in Boston, USA on April 15th, 2013 to watch the famous Boston Marathon foot race. Thousands of other people had gathered from all over the world uh, to witness the race firsthand. And there was a festive atmosphere in the air as the crowd cheered on the different runners. James and his friends had stationed themselves right at the finish line in order to catch the action as it unfolded. But what they didn't know was that they were going to experience far more than a race. For suddenly and without warning, a bomb exploded just meters from where James stood. Smoke billowed up into the air as the ground shook. Then, just seconds later, a second bomb exploded, sending shrapnel and destruction into the crowd. Three people were killed and 264 were injured, including James Costello. James was badly burned on his legs. He was rushed to Massachusetts General Hospital where he underwent multiple operations. From there, he was transferred to Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital to endure the long and grueling process of recovery. And suddenly, James' life was on hold. Everything was stopped as he lay crippled on his bed, wondering if he would ever recover dark days of doubt and depression were worsened by painful treatments and physical therapy. But then, in the midst of his agony, something beautiful and unexpected took place. A young nurse named Krista D'Agostino was assigned to help James in his therapy. Whenever she came to his bedside, the paralyzing problems he faced seemed to disappear. As the days turned to weeks, James found himself not only gaining hope for his recovery, but also falling in love. Eventually, James was able to walk out of the hospital and walk into a new life, a new life filled with hope, love, and Krista. 
And so it was that on August 2014, James and Krista were married in Boston. In summarizing the miraculous turnaround in his life, James wrote these words. April 15th, 2013 was one of the worst days of my life. I soon wondered why and for what reason this had happened. I now realize why I was involved in the tragedy. It was to meet my best friend and the love of my life. What can you and I learn from the inspiring story of James Costello? Simply put, when you trust in God, your problem becomes a platform for your progress. Your burden becomes a bridge to your blessing. For out of death comes resurrection power. That's what King David discovered. Listen to his words in Psalm 40, verses one to three. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He's given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. And when you put your trust in the Lord, you can be confident that he's working in all things to bring about good in your life. No matter how dark the night, resurrection life is coming with the dawn, for God is not finished with you. And that brings us to our third truth today you will experience resurrection power when you follow through and live the unwrapped life. See, when Jesus got to Bethany, he told them to take him to the tomb where Lazarus was buried. He ordered them to roll away the stone covering the tomb. And then in John eleven forty three, 43, the Bible says, Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. Then listen to verse 44. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Friends, do you know what that means? It means that this is how Lazarus came out of the grave. He was alive, but he was hopping because they still had to unwrap him. So Lazarus hopped out of the tomb, and the reason that happened is to show us a powerful truth. The resurrection is just the beginning. Lazarus had resurrected. Power had come upon him. Miracle life had come into him, and Jesus called him forth, and he was risen from the dead, but he was still wrapped in the funeral clothes. And so it is with us today. Resurrection power has come, but there is a process to unwrap it in your life. There's still a work to be done in us so that we manifest his resurrection power. An unwrapped life is one that fully takes advantage of God's power. Unwrapping is the process we all go through that enables us to enjoy the freedom we have in Christ every day. For we are free and we are being made free. We are new in Christ and we are being made new. We are saved and we are being saved. And unwrapping is a process God wants to take take you through to strip away all the remaining remnants and vestiges of death. You see, a lot of people get stuck at the empty tomb, but they don't go any further. A lot of people get stuck at the beginning and never go deeper. We accept Christ, but we don't seem to change. The resurrected Savior comes to live in us, but we're still bound by the grave clothes of our old life. But I challenge you today to live an unwrapped life. I challenge you to experience the resurrection and the freedom that it brings to every single area of of your life. That's why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18, for the Lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us, just put your hand on your chest and say, me too. All of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. And God is telling us that when you have the spirit, you will have freedom, but that freedom has to be unwrapped in your life. You're called to live in the light of Jesus' resurrection every day and to be changed to become more and more like him. 
For the resurrection is simply a launching pad to a new life lived daily in his power. When Jesus said, unwrap him and let him go, there was more to his words than we realize. Jesus wasn't just saying, loose him from some cloth. He was saying, let him go forth with power. Let him go forth with the word. Let him go forth with the gospel. Let him go forth and bring glory to my name. And he says the same thing to us today. Unwrap him, unwrap her. Be free from every vestige of death. Let everything that reminds you of the past be stripped away. Let everything that connects you or ties you to death, be removed from your life. For when you're unwrapped, you're free to go forth with the gospel. Go forth with the power of God. Go forth with the anointing. Go forth and achieve your destiny. Go forth and bring glory to God. That's the lesson we can learn from one of the world's greatest runners, a man named Glenn Cunningham. Glenn Cunningham was just eight years old when he was trapped inside his primary school during a fire. Glenn was burned so badly, the doctors didn't think he would survive. And even if he did live, they would sure he would never walk again. The fire had devastated the lower part of his body. He lost all the flesh on his knees and shins and all the toes on his left foot. But Glenn made up his mind that he would live. He clung to the promise of Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And miraculously, Glenn began to recover. But Glenn believed that God hadn't saved his life for him just to be a cripple. So even though the doctor said he would never walk again, he made up his mind he would walk. When he wasn't in bed, He was confined to a wheelchair. One sunny day, his mother wheeled him out into the garden to get some fresh air. She went back inside to cook. And Glenn, when he was left alone, decided to act. So instead of sitting there, he mustered all the might he could and threw himself out of his chair onto the ground. Then he pulled himself across the grass, dragging his weak legs behind him. He worked his way to the fence, bordering their lot. With great effort, he grabbed hold of the fence and raised himself up. Then inch by inch, he began dragging himself along the fence, resolved that he would walk. He started to do this every day until he wore a path around the yard beside the fence. Two years after the fire, Glenn Cunningham walked by himself. But Glenn believed that God hadn't saved his life for him to walk, but not run. So Glenn started to run. He began to run to school. He ran everywhere that he could. Later in college, Glenn made the athletic team in the foot races, where his tremendous determination paid off. He became one of the most celebrated runners of his day. He competed in the 1932 and the 1936 Summer Olympics. In 1936, The boy they said would never walk again set the world record in the 800 meter run. In 1938, he set a world record in the indoor mile run of 4.04 seconds. But Glenn believed that God hadn't saved his life for him just to win races. So after retiring from running, Glenn Cunningham started a home for troubled youth. His youth ranch helped over 9,000 troubled and disadvantaged teenagers find a new start in life. The boy they thought would die ended up saving thousands of other lives. For Glenn Cunningham discovered what we all need to discover today. When God resurrects your life, he does it for a purpose. It may take time and effort, but as you unwrap your potential one step at a time, you live life fully. You discover the power of an unwrapped life. See, God didn't save you just so you could make it to heaven. He didn't raise you just so you would sit wrapped up with grave clothes. His resurrection power is in you to bring you life. His resurrection power is in you to give you the grace to walk by faith. His resurrection power is in you to give you the strength to run the race. His resurrection power is in you to enable you to win the prize and receive your reward. 
So what has you bound today? You can experience the joy of liberation for that's the promise found in Romans 8, 9 to 11. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. So are you facing the challenge of unmet expectations? Surrender your disappointment to God. Remember, die to your own expectations and let God resurrect his will in you. Have faith and realize that God has unfinished business. This is not the end. God is working something in your life for his glory. And when you put your hope in him, he never fails. You will experience the unwrapped life. For the one who raised Christ from the dead lives in you and his resurrection power will unwrap every corner of your life by the power of his resurrection. Let me take a moment and pray for you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that resurrection power will come upon each and every one listening to me today. I pray that you will loose the spirit of liberty and freedom and grace today into every life. Lord, I pray for a divine revelation that we will see and understand and experience your power, your spirit living inside of us. I bind every spirit of the devil that is hindering your people today. I bind every selfish, vain glory every conceit and arrogance. I bind every spirit that would try to stir your people to seek their own way. And Lord, we lay our lives on the altar today and we say, Lord, have your way in us. Kill in us anything that does not please you, but resurrect in us every dream, every opportunity, every relationship, every business, every talent, every ministry, every gift that will bring glory and honor to your name. Today, I speak freedom from fear to you to everyone who's bound by the spirit of fear. I speak liberty and peace and hope to you. I speak life to your bodies. If you're feeling sick right now, just touch your body wherever you're feeling sick. I loose and release healing power in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak life to your soul. Every temptation taken hold of you. I break the chain of lust. I break the chain of pornography. I break the bondages and the temptation of sin in your life in the name of Jesus. Listen, Listen, the Holy Spirit is let me know there's someone watching today, someone listening today. You have been committing adultery. You have a girlfriend, a side chick. You've been cheating on your wife. You've not told her. Nobody really knows, but you know right now God is convicting you. He's putting his finger on it. That thing needs to die. That relationship needs to die. It is ungodly. It is not from the spirit of Christ. It has come to tempt you and destroy you and put you in the grave. But today I break that chain of sin. I break that chain of darkness, that bondage over your life in the name of Jesus, and I speak liberty and deliverance to you in Jesus name. Now get on your knees and repent. Get on your knees and say, God, forgive me. Jesus, cleanse me by your blood. Get on your knees right now and lift your hands and call out to God. For if you confess your sin to him, he is gracious and just, and he will forgive your sin. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you've got to do business with God right now so that his work in you, his life in you can come over you and fill you. I speak freedom from shame today. Everybody who's feeling shame over things you've done, things you've said, there's regrets in your life. I speak freedom from that shame by the blood of Jesus. Let it be washed away as you surrender yourself to God. I speak freedom from fear and worry and shame and pride. I speak freedom from insecurity. And I speak resurrection life over you, your family, your mind, your body, your finance, and your destiny. God says that right now, some of you are sitting there thinking, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know where the money's going to come from. I don't know where the strength is going to come from. But he says, my child, do not worry for you are in my hands. I am taking care of you. And I speak by the power of the Holy Spirit today. Come forth, loose him, loose her 
and be free in Jesus' name. Come on and give the Lord some praise with me right now. Lift up your hands and praise him and bless him and thank him for his resurrection power. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 